more than welcome. So I'm going to start uh, by asking for declarations of interest in this um, in this meeting, please. Any anything on the agenda? No, sir. No. OK, good. Um, apologies, then we have uh, apologies, Liz. Sorry, um, just one apology from Suzanne Rankin, Actually, Chief Executive. What one other? Yes, Suzanne is attending an inquest today. Uh, and also Aaron, uh, one of our new non-executive oh. colleagues, couldn't clear his diary for the open meeting. He did join us earlier on the closed meeting. Um, and welcome to our two non-executive directors, of which one is in the meeting, but welcome to Dami Adebayo, uh, who's on the meeting with us. Uh, first open board meeting. Welcome. Um, Thank you, Andrew. Delighted to, ha delighted to have you on board. Uh, right, so we, no further ado, we'll move on to the minutes. And this is the minutes of the meeting on the 1st of October. So any comments on the minutes? I'll go through them page by page, actually, and make it easier. Page one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Tom, thank thanks, Andy. I, I think David had his hand up as well, but I've got a just a point on page twelve. Yeah. Um, which is which is minute 087 2020. It's just my job title is incorrect on that should be director of strategy and sustainability thanks for that uh yeah david's hand has just come up uh it's strange there's a lag um but there you go david um i, I just i just had a few which you, which you whizzed past the first was on page four i think it's not quite clear what i was saying um so the, it's the initiative about the health well and well-being there, which has been an enormous kind of uh, success and boost to our staff. And the feedback had been excellent. The, the, the thing that I had done wrong was that I hadn't alerted the other chief execs or the system that we were doing that. That was the only um, the point there, um, but it just comes across a bit confusing, really. Okay. Um, and then page page nine. Um, the important points to give in consideration. This was about flow, and this is the the, the issue here was um, that that, that there've been issues with or, or concerns about transferring patients out from the hospital into the nursing homes and seeding COVID in the first wave, um, and that had given some concerns and new new uh, barriers in some ways had been put in place. We'd looked at our data, and that had been satisfactory. And the other bit was that the way the system was put together in the first wave did reduce organizational barriers and there needs to be a kind of financial analysis of how that how that worked because that may be a better system financially as well as well as for the patients so I just didn't articulate those that well and I've got one more which is 11 and that's on the um, from the annual equality report it's the bit the gap between BAME and white colleagues entering the discipline process had reduced there's, there's just been some slightly different versions in the, in, in the res on how that's been reported. Um, so in, in some it's 0.97 times less likely if you're from a BAME background to enter disciplinary procedure. We just need to make sure we've got, got that right because in that case it's the closed, the gap is closed, but it's been reported slightly differently in other areas. So we just need to align that. And I did I did write to Pammy about that. We just need to make sure we've got that. Uh, so just to be correct. clear, are the minutes right or the minutes need amending? Um, well, I think I did make that point that I was worried about the report. OK, wasn't so right, can I ask so. you, David, to just work with Liz kind of yep. offline on, on, on the actual wording? There, there are only minor clarifications, but they're important. Yep. Yeah, OK. 
Any others, David? No, that was it. Okay. This is testing my multitasking to move through the minutes with one finger, talk, and keep my keep my eye out for the hands. Um, clearly, uh, clearly, uh, I need more uh, more more schooling on this. Uh, Tom, you still got your hand up? Sorry, I thought I'd taken it down. I will try again. Okay, no, it's um, it's, it's a Microsoft Teams feature. Um, we've got, I think, to page twelve. That's uh, so to page thirteen. And the last page, fourteen. Okay, so with those uh, exceptions uh, brought up by Tom and David, I'll be happy to accept those. Please. Yeah. Okay. Let me just do that. Right. We move on to the action log. Uh, I think we haven't got any actions for this meeting. Actions that are future meeting and closed actions. So unless there are any comments on anything there. Uh, I will move on from the action log. OK. OK, thank you. Um, and we have got a very full agenda today. Um, so if I ask, uh, please, that people presenting the reports um, do it succinctly, just bring to the attention any any particular bits of the report that you want us to look at and obviously make it clear if they've been through a subcommittee as well. Otherwise, we, we could be here a very long time. Um, Jane. Uh, so, sorry, Chair. I, I, ju I just noticed on um, on one of the actions, which is um, on the 25th of July, we, we talk about clinical outcomes for women uh, at the prison. Um, and we were going to provide a standalone report, which actually didn't come to the quality committee in so, November. Oh, so it's not closed then, this action? So, and we were going to report in January, so I think we might need to just move that and, and have it at the next quality committee, Andrea, um, please. Um, and so that then we can bring it uh, to board. OK, so we, we what's the date on that? Because it, 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 it says it, it says for a, a submission to the quality committee in November. OK, so we did submit something last year. I'm just. About Bronzefield. Uh, and then bring uh, and report to the board in January 2020. So is that an old Okay. Well, we need you to just bottom that out because we did we did report against it. I don't know if anybody remembers we but we did have a paper so come that's about Bronzefield. Then, is it? That's complete. And we don't do that as an annual then. No, no it was a one off. It, it was a yeah. one off, wasn't it? Okay, well then that's done. Then that's okay. I think I, I raised it originally, didn't I? You that, did. Yeah. You did, Andy. Right, yeah. that's fine. Then that is complete. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, with no further ado, then I shall move on to to my report, and I will take that as read. Um, clearly, the first bit, just just focusing on the executive summary, that we are in an extraordinary period uh, of pressure on on uh, the hospital and the staff. Um, not only COVID, not only the capacity issues that that introduces, uh, but also now having to organise the uh twice weekly staff testing lateral flow testing that's coming in very shortly uh we've got think 111 coming online at the beginning of december and we've got the mass vaccination program added to of course the flu uh, that's already underway <clears throat> so just really making the point apologies my, i'll let my clock go uh, um just making the point really that the, this is uh, an extraordinary period of pressure uh, and that the health and well-being initiatives that we've uh, launched are really, really important um, uh, and, and vital in that. Um, so that's that's the, the preamble. Um, on a lighter note, just just a few things that uh, and I know we're, they're in uh, one of them is in Suzanne's report as well, but the, the visit of the chief midwifery officer, it was great to see her. Uh, Jacqueline came. She was very open in her presentation as to where where things were going, uh, the safety issues around midwifery generally, um, and actually a lot of that was a cover. Actually, she was coming to present to um, Gemma Puckett, our, our now chief midwife. She was the acting chief midwife then, um, 
the silver medal, and that was for her outstanding performance and leadership during wave one of COVID. Uh, was well deserved, and and that went down really, really uh, well. I think with uh, there were lots of midwives uh, online, uh, and a few uh, in the lecture theatre with us, uh, and that went down really well. Uh, I'm there. You can see there the recruitment of our two non-executive directors, um, and that was a really strong field as well. Um, but again, I wanted to put on record um, the, my thanks really to the team. The HR team in particular, but also to Jane and Louise, who did the long listing. Uh, you know, a lot of hard work uh, to get two great candidates. Thank you. Um, and we had our first uh, virtual annual members meeting, which um, again, it's thanks really to uh, Sal and her team, uh, both the comms and the governance teams heavily involved. Uh, lots of grey hairs um, that I'm sure have been covered up by now. Um, but it was it went really well and it was fraught getting ready for it because of the technology uh, but i think it's gone over well i've put a link to the uh, annual members meeting for anybody who hasn't seen it uh, very good and last but not least i'll draw attention to the allied health professionals day this is the second time i've been asked to kind of kick that off again that was a mixed uh, actual and virtual event um but you know, the enthusiasm, their enthusiasm was infectious, actually, um, and they were really up for innovation. And we've seen that, haven't we, through the physio going out to the Riverbourne Club, uh, which has been reported on. But not just that, they had so many examples of great innovation. I went round their poster competition later uh, and I was blown away by some of the stuff they're doing. And I think, you know, that uh, we really need to take that forward. Uh, and a lot of it, I know, falls into your area, Tom, in terms of, uh, you know, links with the community and things like that. So, again, really, really helpful. I'm not going to say any more. I, uh, I'll take the rest as read, but happy to uh, answer any questions you may have on the report. Um, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And, and um, yes, a, a very succinct report, uh, as, as always. I was struck by, by two things. The first observation is you go to an awful lot of meetings <clears throat> to keep uh, this board, this hospital plugged into what's happening around the system. Um, but the one that I was just curious to know just a little bit more about was your um, regular contact with the regional director, um, Anne uh, Eden about the regional position on COVID and progress on restoration. I'm just wondering if there's anything there that we should understand or, or note today. And I appreciate it's a very fast moving picture, but I, I'm sensing that with winter pressures building, um, uh, our elective agenda is going to be under um, more uh, pressure. And um, I'm also expecting that that might create system wide issues around patient flow. I'm just curious about any insights you have from from her and the regional level in particular? Yeah, and I think it's not just from the regional level, I'll probably get more at the Surrey Heartlands level. So uh, um, Anne Eden, actually she's doing a broadcast this afternoon, which I can't go to uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, they do put out some comprehensive reports. I've just put one in the reading room actually for, uh, for there. I think in the southeast, clearly the uh, infection rate recently has just started. David can comment more, but to flatten out, but it's very early days. Um, I think in terms of performance, everybody is stretched across the region. Uh, Kent is more stretched than most. Um, uh, Surrey Hartlands has been performing particularly well, I think, in restoration terms. Uh, and when you come down to our trust, of course, we set realistic targets and we have managed to meet them. But it is a real struggle. And I'll, I'll let uh, James and uh, David add, add anything to that. Um, but I think the we have seen a replication of what happened in the north of England in terms of case rates. What we haven't seen yet everywhere in the southeast is the numbers in ICU. Um, Although we have been collaborating as a system to move ICU patients and we have taken patients I know from SASH um, when they when they were overrunning. Um, I don't know, James, or uh, would yeah. you like to comment on that? I think you're absolutely right. So we've taken four patients now from SASH to support 
them as part of the mutual aid arrangements across Surrey Heartlands. And it, we were on a, a conference at Eden arranged uh, for all the coups yesterday. So me and a couple of members of my team were on uh, to share information, share best practice across the South. I th it was, in some ways it's good, in other ways it's disheartening when, when you've done all of that. So it was good that all of the, pretty much all of the things that we were being commented on there, the whole drive of the, of what they're doing in the South really is around splitting um, green and blue flows and having dedicated elective sites where you can do that, which is a journey we were on pre-COVID and one that's been um, speeded up significantly since COVID. So we were, we're on that journey and, and I think we're ahead of uh, others who are trying to think about it, we're on it. And things around some of the digital platforms around pre-assessment, we're already on that. So I think there's there's good stuff happening across, across it. We're on to a lot of that, but you're absolutely right. All areas are struggling with the, the uh, issue of keeping electives on through the winter. A common thing across the patch is the use of the independent sector. Um, the national train change to the way the independent sector is being harnessed to support the NHS is going to have a big impact. So from the 1st of January, we we all move from a from a an arrangement whereby we've sort of rented facilities uh, from the private sector in terms of what we need to an outsource arrangement. And whilst that that's helpful, you know, the national intention is that's helpful for us. It removes beds, which is which is an issue on the St Peter's side. Removes some ring fence green beds that we use for our electives. But that's a common issue that everybody was raising that. Uh, across the south? I think, I mean, I would be safe to say uh, that I was very disappointed that the uh, it was chosen nationally to not carry on with a national uh, picture on, on the use of the independent sector because that has been so helpful to us and to actually go back down to local commissioning. Um, clearly there's pressure from the independent sector who want to carry on with their work, um, but, you know, to devolve this right down to local commissioning when we've got other things on, I think was generally unhelpful, um, but that was the decision, so so be it. Um, Neil, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. That's some helpful context. Thank you. Any other? Yes, uh, who's, who's just a look? Tom? Yeah, thanks, Andy. It's just, as you mentioned, the uh, AHPs in the physio department and their work in the, in the local gyms, I just thought it would be worth just mentioning um, that they have now been shortlisted for a parliamentary award. Uh, they were nominated by um, by the local MP Ben Spencer uh, and have now been shortlisted. So all being well, they will be receiving an award in uh, in Parliament sometime next summer. But it's just really fantastic news and and just great recognition of the work that they've been doing, which they do very humbly, but is actually really pioneering work. Um, you know, the first in its kind nationally. And and I just I just think it's 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 just great that they're getting this recognition now. I think they've actually won the South East Award, haven't they? And they're now shortlisted for the National Award. Is that right? I think I think that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, congratulations to the team on that. I think we ought to record that as a board. Um, really, really good. Anything else for me? Otherwise. OK. Thank you. Um, David, could you um, lead in on uh, Suzanne's report? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to. Um, well, I'll take the report as read, and uh, as you can see, it's um, it's peppered with lots of people stuff. Which, uh, firstly, I mean, Suzanne makes the point that she she loves being back here, and she, as you can see, she's been uh, busy getting down to it. I think there are a number of things in the report. I just want to draw your attention to. Firstly, uh, she talks about Andrea's appointment, and we're all absolutely delighted uh, that Andrea became the substantive uh, chief nurse. Um, I think she draws attention to a number of areas. One is, which I, if you haven't seen it, is James's video that he put together, which I think is a really good reflection of what the teams uh, have been doing. And she also draws attention to the, the health and wellbeing work that uh, Louise's team has been doing. And I think that the real change is this proactive um, intervention with the staff to, to try and give them support. Um, when, when, when sometimes they're reluctant to help. So I think that's a really uh, brilliant step forward. Um, I think I'm, I'm enormously proud of Masil uh, Venegri getting a British Empire medal. I, I just think it's, uh, it's one of the most wonderful things. And actually, he was, um, he was absolutely fantastic in 
bringing innovation to the trust and helping us bring new techniques. But I think it was also, to me, it was how he looked after his team and actually had a member of his team who died and how he supported the family, how he put together um, a memorial service in the middle of COVID, which was which was absolutely in, incredibly uh, moving. Um, and I think the other the other thing that I draw your attention to, which I I hadn't myself seen much about, was the Imagine project, which I think is such a fantastic project um, and really symbolises um, us being an anchor institution and supporting initiatives in the community uh, and actually bringing them in to give give uh, uh, youngsters some opportunities. And that's a really good thing. And I think we've got lots of opportunities for this kind of thing at the moment with our need for increase in our workforce, the difficulty that the youngsters in our community are in having in having jobs uh, and coming out of the community. And I think that's I think that's just a real great symbol of uh, of what we should be doing from our organisation into the community. Um, I'm happy to take in any questions uh, if, if, if I can answer them. Thanks, David. So any 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 points or questions on Suzanne's paper? No. Well, thank you for bringing that out, uh, David. And, and obviously, uh, we did we did say welcome to Andrea on the last board meeting, actually, because yeah, it had just been announced then, hadn't it, Andrea? So, uh, so uh, congratulations again. Thank you, David, for doing that. And uh, yes, and Neil's just made the comment, and I know Marcin as well has seen it. The uh, James's video is really, really great, and uh, I'm just worried the BBC might come and uh, poach him now. The new director of the new Doctor Who. <laughs> I, I, I thought the new apprentice actually. That's what. Oh, I was new apprentice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Great. So we're now going to move on to our quality and safety section. Um, and before we do the, uh, before we hand over to Andrea and David, uh, Jane, would you like to bring our attention to anything from the quality committee point of view? Yeah. Th thanks very much. Um, uh, well, obviously the report was presented at the committee. Um, we uh, we noted uh, that well, and we're pleased to note that medication safety um, had, uh, the the initiatives in that area had been uh, maintained, which is really positive. Um, we we um, we were so concerned around um, uh, infections, uh, infection targets, particularly uh, the surgical site infections, which still remain. A massive challenge which I know Andrew will pick up uh, when she picks up the report um, so that's something that the committee is quite keen to start to see an improvement in because we are an outlier uh, as, as a trust and I think it's important that we, we start to get a focus around that and that's particularly in relation to fractured neck of femur surgery mm. and also we are seeing some issues in maternity around cesarean section infection uh, rates uh, post, post cesarean section um, we we were pleased to see that complaints performance has been maintained, so that was good, and that was good to see. One of the things we discussed was around patient experience, and we felt we still feel at the committee that we need a little bit more visibility around that. And we're hoping that the new viewpoint will help us, um, and we particularly are keen to hear not just negative uh, aspects of of experience, because quite often we focus on complaints. And incidents where things have gone wrong, but we really want to hear about the positive things. Um, picking up from the chief executive's report, it's really good to hear a lot of the positive things we're doing. Um, and with regard to patient experience, I think we want to get a more rounded um, level of reporting to the committee. And we're hopeful going forward that we will we will be provided with that. So, Andrew, if you can then pick up the main points of the report, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, OK, thanks. Thanks, Jane. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. So um, the bits I'll pick up on, I think um, from a so for, with regards to our quality priority uh, indicators, uh, again, medical, sa medical safety improvement, we're, we're doing well from an infection prevention and control perspective. Actually, we are across a lot of our infections where we're hitting the target. There's, there's a couple of little pockets around um, methicillin sensitive staph aureus and Klebsiella. Uh, these are bacteremias that um, we've got a, a 
we're not hitting the target, but we've got to focus on that. And um, we've appointed um, a few months ago uh, an IV nurse. We'd had a gap in that for quite a couple of years. Um, and, and and having that new appointment, she's very good. She's from the Royal Berkshire, um, Louise Hamilton. She's she's really re reinvigorated the whole sort of IV programme. We've got a new IV steering group now, and uh, she's reinvigorated the training and doing very much bespoke training now at, at the wards um, at point of care. So hopefully we'll start to see the change in the dial with, with regards to, to, to that. With regards to the COVID situation, this I mean, this, this report is on um, on the data from October September and October uh, this year. We're actually our numbers in September of those admitted with COVID-35 and it can see it increased to 92 in October. It's increased, golly, even more so in November fourfold. I would I would suggest it's uh, uh, November's been incredibly busy, but actually in that time, certainly from September, we've we've um, our focus has been obviously on hospital, trying to prevent and minimise uh, hospital acquired uh, COVID. Uh, and although we have seen some uh, transmission, actually our numbers have been low and of the outbreaks that we we have had again the number in the outbreaks has has been low compared to, to other trusts within the region in fact i've just seen the latest data that's come out today and actually from a southeast perspective we are the lowest acute trust with with mission so although <laughs> it's felt very it has felt challenging there's no two ways about it because we've got um we're operationally challenged uh with regards to our capacity bed capacity again in in um it, due to that our transmission actually has been low so uh, it's involved a lot of focus up with regards to ipc um practice and process which we will continue with and um, surgical site infection you did mention that jane and i think you're right it, we are an outlier we're at 4.5 percent with regards to fractured neck of femur rate uh, compared to a national average of only 1.1 you'll see in the report at appendix two it's got a, a um uh, it states really what we're doing with regards to that and the interventions that we're implementing we've appointed another surgical site uh, uh, infection nurse so that uh, boosts the team of two which is really good so again um will help with um, promoting what we're doing around that. So hopefully we'll start to see an improvement. Lots of different bundles have been implemented. With regards to death, I know David is going to be um, briefly on the, on the um, learning from death report, but actually our numbers for September and October were lower compared to this time last year. And actually from a COVID perspective, again, we're sort of following the same trend nationally uh, with regards to that national uh, picture. From an SI perspective, there were 11 in total. Uh, this consisted of maternity incidents, um, unexpected deaths. There was a misdiagnosis and a prescribing error. And there was two incidents around our pathology uh, service. One was an IT problem and the other was a contamination problem. And all of those are be currently being investigated. With regards to harms, there's two bits I'd like to pull out of that. We did report at the last uh, committee about pressure damage. There was a real concern about our pressure damage, particularly with um, uh, with the the, the um, significant uh, damage of, um, of of category three, I, I'm delighted to say we've seen an improvement with that. We re reinvigorated the hundred day uh, pressure um, free campaign within the trust, which we'd had before COVID and it had been very successful. Uh, and and because of that, and I think the reinvigorated campaign and the focus again, we've seen a reduction in, in pressure damage, which is good. The bit we are really focusing on, though, is our malnutrition scoring tool that that uh, should be undertaken on admission. Um, and that's been a new quality priority that we've implemented this year. Um, uh, because actually, if uh, malnutrition is, is it, it's so important, if our patients are are actually hydrated uh, and and uh, are being fed well that will have a huge influence on all the other harms that we have with regards to tissue uh, our skin integrity um uh, which then with the mobility leading to falls etc it has a huge influence on all of the other harms so and also vte so so it's really important we get that right there's lots of training taking place around that and we are seeing an improvement and we hope to well i should continue as we go forward just a little bit on complaints. Performance was 90% overall for, for the um, September, October. The PALS, um, most of the PALS uh, contacts were again were around COVID, around the restricted visiting 
and the communication around that. We've got we've got work streams in place to do that. Uh, and we have shown our compliments again. We're not really been capturing our compliments that well, but with the introduction of viewpoint feedback uh, platform, we will definitely see an improvement in that. And I'll finish on healing arts because we've reinvigorated the healing arts program following uh, COVID, following the first wave of COVID. Uh, and we've seen a, um, and this is really exciting because we've had uh, money um, from the charitable funds of £100,000 to help us with, with this healing arts program because the patient experience and staff experience really following COVID has definitely changed. So it's just key uh, um, work streams to pull out of that. We're doing distraction screens within our waiting areas and we're starting with A&E um, to, to, with regards to that and that's to help with reducing anxiety and boredom uh, with, with people who are, who are waiting. We're getting music piped into our children's area and also one of our medical wards as well. We're going to start, start there. Again, that gives more control for the patient as to what music they want to hear. We're getting planters uh, positioned. Again, this is through the Imagine Project outside of the hospital and also uh, within our education centre and the staff outside area that we're we're developing and that'll have the nice planted lovely flowers and stuff in inside and again will be maintained by the Imagine project and we were donated a Damien Hirst painting um, he'd, he'd sent those out to to certain trusts and we were recipients of that so we're currently in the process of just getting that framed into a boxed frame and we'll have that um, hung in in reception uh, as well. So that was that was a, a a lovely a lovely surprise to to receive that. Um, I'm going to end it there, Andy. Um, just to like some key points. Any questions on on the report? Happy to take. Thank you, uh, uh, David. Is there anything you want to add? Sorry, I, I did want to add just a couple of things. Yeah, and, go and for it's it. in some of the areas. So so I suppose just drawing your attention to um, to the interaction with the EPR system. So benefits and realization piece in EPR. I mean, the quality report is where all the benefits are going to be realised. And what we've got to make sure is that um, the EPR system does enhance the medication safety programme and our surveillance programme. That there are some, some challenges in surgical site infection, but, but I would draw your attention to, unless you look for it and, you, and you, you have the right surveillance things in place, you will miss and ignore it. And I think one of the big things that's in place is we are now got really good processes of picking up infections, reporting them and acknowledging them and knowing we're going to make a difference. And we always knew we would look worse while we're putting these things in place, but that, that's taken us quite a long time to do it. But having a monthly report on fractured neck of femur uh, surgical infections is is really that's really impressive you, you won't see that in many in many organizations um i think in terms of uh, transmission which 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 andrea is saying is just we need to keep an eye out on on all the other infections as well as andrew drew your attention to and i think i think there are some signs that, that, that there are some of those that are moving in the right direction as well and they should all move in the right direction if we get it right but I think just uh, just draw your attention that it's it's infection prevention control which is which PPE and so on but we've doing so much work now with uh, with estates um, and the infrastructure and Massiel's team are all mm. part of this solving this thing and I mean myself Andrea Simon and Tom we've got and we've had heated debates about um, Air, air vent, ventilation and air purification within this organization, water purification uh, and and just the general infrastructure of people coming in and out of the hospital. And I think that's uh, that's quite an exciting change on on how much debate about the quality agenda is happening in the estates place and how we're all joining mm. up. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Marcy. Uh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, Andrew, it's really a question for you and a, and a triangulation between reports, and that is about complaints and communication. If you link that with the Freedom, Freedom to Speak Up Guardian report, we have an issue about how staff are speaking to each other and to patients. Before COVID, we had a plan to use um, the Healing Arts Program and actors to do a watch of this, observe how staff talk to each other and to patients, and then feed it back as a training event. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that lost because we found mm -hmm. the research shows from another hospital, it had a massive uh, effect when you can actually see yourself and know it was you, how you communicated with people. And I really think that we've got an issue about communication between mm. patients and between staff. And I really think we need to put some effort in on this. So I'm hoping post in the spring 
Easter yeah. when we get life back to normal. Um, if we could actually move on that agenda again, Andrea, because yeah. I think it's quite concerning. So my question was, when you capture complaint data and communication data, do you capture it by staff member and by division so that we could focus our efforts on how we could turn that around? Thank yeah, you. so so good question. Um, and we do. We do capture that. Um, so so that, that so that, yes, there can be a focus. And, and, and going back to your your plays you you're absolutely right there is the power of of using those so we have we had brian daniels come in to to do some um obviously when we were able to do that face to face i have commissioned him to do some virtual uh pieces well it's basically filmed pieces actually that we can then so so we can absolutely and i think it's a great idea incorporates your suggestion into that um because uh, you, you're right communities although we are doing divisions have a focus on it that it's still cropping up still cropping up. and I know it's it's it, I put people are stressed people are, are under pressure with what, what you know with COVID but it's still no excuse so um um yeah I think that's a great idea so I'll take that I'll take that away Marcin thank you other questions for Andrea I've got a couple um for you Andrea and then we'll we'll come back and Danny's got one I see um the IPC uh on your uh, on your executive summary, uh, you're listing out a load of targets, the norm, normal targets we've had, CDF, etc. Does the North Star actually now render these all the targets to zero? Well, <laughs> it, so that's a really good question, Andy. So we're on a journey with this. Our North Star objective does state that we will eradicate all infections, um, but we are on a journey with that. So we did make, we discussed this actually, didn't we, Jane, at, um, at the Quality of Care Committee. Yeah, and so, yeah, so so for this year, we'd, we're we sticking to, we have got to, got to um, uh, meet these targets that we have set for this year. When it comes to next year, so 2021 to 22, then we will be working towards Zero. I mean, it's it's a huge. It is a huge, huge ask. To be fair, um, you know, but but we 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 just need to show that we're on that that improvement trajectory. The other okay. thing, uh, Andy, just to just to cut across, the other thing we did add in, uh, Andrew, is that for this year, in addition to making sure we hit all the targets that are set for. Um, uh, infections. Uh, we also would would set the target for COVID in mm. relation to no hospital acquired COVID. So that yeah, was right. that was this year's target that we added in uh, because we felt that was absolutely fundamental for this this year. So we've, had, we've added that into the committee to monitor that. That's correct, and that's actually definitive cases. So those that are 15 days uh, and over, because they are that is definitive hospital yeah. transmission. OK, um, and just to reinforce what you said about pressure ulcers, I said it in the closed board, mm. but I'll say it again that, you know, it's it is really effective. And when I go and present the certificates, the 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 staff there are just delighted and, they're you know, just to be told that they're keeping patients safe and thank you and giving them that. It, it does. It, it seems a small thing, but it's actually disproportionate. Um, and it also gives me the one single excuse I have to go on the wards, which is great. Thank you. Um, and the final one, which is for Simon, great Damien Hurst painting. Have we insured it? I don't know if Simon will be able to answer that. I, we are looking at the insurance. I know Jackie is definitely, is, but it was discussed. Yeah. I think we'd asked the same question previously, but I haven't caught up with yeah. that one. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so, the value is 3000. We got it valued. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Dami. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my question was for Andrea, really, about the in infection prevention and control, about the E. coli bacteremias. I noticed that over the last two months, September and October, there were 36, mm. and only two were apportioned to the hospital, which uh, suggests that the remaining are community acquired or uh, and largely UTIs. I just wondered mm. how much communication there had been, uh, certainly with our GP colleagues uh, to, to to try and reduce this, and how much education there 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 has been, uh, and and information sharing really. Mm. 
use this. Do you want to come in, David, on that? Is that, is that yeah. a hand up? Yeah. Yeah, because I think um, so. So you are right, Dami, that that most E. coli infections occur in uh, in the community, and a lot are urinary tract and catheter related. And in fact, we we ran the national catheter project uh, from this hospital to educate uh, paramedics and people in the community to reduce that, and that's still the way forward. Now, COVID has has paused that training program uh, for a while, but but I think that is effective in people understanding uh, how to look after after catheters and um, and and keep keep patients safe from this, along with hydration as well, which is the other cause in in the community. So I think we have tried to 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 engage in a in a community program as well, because you're you're quite right. The bulk of E. coli septicemia occurs outside our walls, um, and the devastation from septicemia from uh, these gram-negative bacteremias is is absolutely huge in terms of mortality, but also morbidity um, in, in in the population. Um, so, so it's a, it's a good point, Dami, and we could, we could always do more. But we were instrumental in setting up the National Catheter Project. Does that answer your question, Dami? It, it does. It does. It Thank you. OK. Um, any other questions on this? Say good, good report again, you know, well, well structured, easy to read. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, we'll move on now. Um, Jane, anything you'd like to bring our attention to on the quality of care minutes for September? I think it, um, as, as my colleagues will know, I mean, we've had another meeting since uh, since these minutes. So um, just to say that in September we are we were really aiming to try to get business back to normal. So we were receiving some of the annual reports um, and uh, and that was and we also had representation from each of the divisions. And that was really good because we hadn't been able to do that for some time. So they were really very welcome and I think they brought a richness in, uh, although we do, we have reflected that we probably need to tighten up the actual report framework, but that's that's for us to do within the committee. And the minutes are there to, to read. We've talked about a lot of the issues um, previously, uh, just to say that the cytology incident that we discussed at length in the September board, uh, we are still waiting to hear uh, if there has been any harms but at the moment we have not been told there have been any patient harms as a result of the the issue around uh, the cytology matter um, so that was good to hear um, and um, we know that with safeguarding one of the issues that was raised in September was we were concerned that the adult safeguarding team were quite small compared with the child safeguarding team and we understand now business case has been put forward to try to to rectify that to strengthen that team so that was really pleasing um, and then we've had a meeting in November if you want me to talk about that I can if not I'll I'll, I'll, I'll stop now if there are any highlights you want you wanted to bring from the meeting um, I, I think just to say that we did have a report um from learning from mortality, which I'm sure David will pick up when we look at that. But the medical examiner is in post and she's been doing some really excellent work in working across uh, boundaries and actually working into the community, linking with the coroner and has developed a the first uh, form that can be used. And um, I'll just look at the name of it now. Um, you might have to help me with that one, David. But the medical examiner has, has developed a, a Pacific form, which is the first of its kind. Uh, which is really positive and I was really pleased to see how proactive uh, that individual is being and she's also now been invited to to attend the uh, quality committee in the future which I think will really add some richness to our learning from from death's work um, so I'll leave it at that and just take okay. any questions thank you any questions on the minutes or indeed anything that Jane has just said okay no thank you um, in which case we will move on to the learning from mortality reviews. Um, and David, you're going to uh, lead on this? Yeah, so um, so as Jane said, this was discussed at the Quality Care Committee. And the reason it's at this meeting as well is that it, it needs board approval. It's for noting and board approval. So that's, that's why it's been brought here. But it has been discussed in detail at the Quality Care Reports. Uh, and as, as Jane says, I think the 
appointment of the medical examiner has been a real step forward and actually the individual who's taken on that role is doing an absolutely uh, fantastic job and was was so um, so supportive during the during the COVID uh, that the, the wave one. I think the other thing that it's worthwhile just looking through the report is that the the issue particularly with with COVID is that it does exacerbate health inequalities and um, we've we've already had a, a patient story from a um, from a patient with learning difficulties and um, and 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 vulnerable vulnerable communities and um, and the elderly have seemed to suffer different disproportionately uh, during COVID, and that's what's been looked at. So, so in that report, you can see that we've we've pulled out people who had suffered from COVID and unfortunately died to go through their their care, uh, and that that the results of that look good. And we've also uh, reviewed and looked through um, the cases uh, of patients with learning difficulties. And as you can see on the first first wave through we didn't pick up all those cases but we have another mechanic mechanism for picking those up through the coding and have picked them all up and reviewed the uh, reviewed those uh, those cases as well so i won't go into great depth because we did talk at detail at the quality care committee but if there's any questions uh, i'm sure jane and i or andrew could could answer just to say for the benefit of the members of the public uh, who would normally see a patient story and i probably should have said this at the beginning um, the patient story, which is a lady with learning difficulties, um, didn't wish to uh, put her story in public um, and and didn't indeed wish for it to be recorded. So we did take that in private, but it was very moving. It was very helpful uh, and there are learnings from it. Um, so I apologise that it hasn't been in public, but uh, we have to take the obviously the wishes of the patient uh, as paramount. Um, so any questions for David? David, I've got one, um, which which is really a sort of language thing. Uh, you know, when, when we get into reports like this, appreciate their quality reports, but so for people who are not clinicians, um, you know, the reason not for review being bilateral, ventriculomedullary, uh, I can't even say it, uh, isn't terribly helpful. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, there's still a bit of work to do, I think, and yeah. making it making these sort of things uh, readable for people yeah, who are not yeah. not medical. Uh, that, that's a that's a very good point. Um, I mean, you can't obviously take it all out, all the medical thing out, but yeah. but I think, yeah, you know, we do have to explain. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea what that is, by the way. <laughs> I really don't. I'll find it on the sheet. Otherwise, I'd tell you. Uh, it's yeah. it's in the um, page bottom of uh, sorry, top of page 10 of 14. Okay. And it's the third one down, a, a late termination and the reason for not review. Sorry, I'm getting it there. Uh, I think there might be a typo in there as well. I think there might be as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. it could be. Because... I know my pronunciation is not brilliant, but um, what was it? Uh, it was a yeah. means yeah. enlarged, uh, enlarged ventricles. So the two chambers of the heart were enlarged. I think that's what they need to say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, it could be that, or it could be uh, could be the brain as well. I suppose, couldn't it? Okay. It's just the general point that's yeah. important. No, really, yeah. You know, not not the specifics really. Um, any other questions for David on the mortality review? And we need to approve this, David. Yep. And I think Suzanne then has to sign it. Okay. Um, and ju oh, just I did have another one actually on the medical officer. You, we, we've said about the medical examiner uh, post. Um, it says in the report that the successful candidate declined to take up the position. So, so is that? You've been talking about somebody great in position. What, what, what's what, what's the balance there? So, so, so the medical examiner is one role. So that's the doctor who's who's taking the role. But the medical officer is the supporting function. Ah. So, okay. so, so they they pulled out, which was a shame. Uh, but we have got someone who's a who's a very good candidate who's going to take on that role. Okay. And certainly, 
Tanya is not um, is not is not shy in coming forward to to say what resource she needs to deliver a great service, which is which is which is very welcome. Yes, I've met her. She isn't shy. Yeah. Um, anything else? Otherwise, can we take this report report as approved, please? Yes. Speak now if you, if you don't wish to. OK, so that's approved, David. Thank you. Um, and now we're going to move on to the annual quality account, which has come to Quality of Care Committee, Jane, hasn't it? Do you want to say what, what, uh, how you've looked at that uh, before we uh, invite Andrea to uh, say something? Yeah, thank you. Um, so this was uh, this was reviewed by the uh, Quality Committee um, for content and for accuracy. Um, uh, we had some small points around accuracy, particularly Marcin, thank you for that, where we, we, we made some small changes to it. Generally, we, we thought the format of the document was clear. Uh, we, we liked it. It needs to come to board for approval. Um, and um, it, it is a slightly different process this year. Um, Andrew, you're probably better placed to describe that because ordinarily there would be uh, more this would have been presented earlier and there was a because of covid uh, there were new arrangements around how the quality account uh, it would needed to be and the timing around it and um, when it needed to be approved so andrew if you could just pick that up because you probably understand that um but it says in the paper about the regulations um and previously obviously uh, andrew if you could just pick that up because i'm not as probably as okay as yeah. you are around that um, and our, uh, from the point of view of, of the actual content um we we have approved that through the committee now prior to bringing to the board okay thank you jane andrea okay thanks um so you're absolutely right uh, normally this this would um this would come a lot earlier in in the calendar around sort of uh, may june time but because of covid um uh, it was agreed obviously with a national perspective to to delay us having to to submit this but it does need to be submitted by december um for this year hence why it's coming to trust board now and has been to quality of care committee this this month so the bits I'm going to to put, this, and also just to add that there are we are mandated with some of the wording within this report actually from a government perspective. So it's just to make that point with how it's how it reads uh, in some aspects. But the bits I would just like to to pull out really is about our quality priorities because it, it it does um, uh, uh, articulate how we how we achieve the uh, quality pr priorities set for 2019 uh, 20 and also performance against the nhs improvement um, indicator so so if i go about the quality priorities first the key areas of, of focus were the learning from deaths and reducing in, in hospital mortality learning from errors and reducing avoidable harm and in hospital infection and learning from patient feedback to ensure an excellent experience so from the learning from from deaths um, and in hospital morta mortality those sub measures um we we didn't achieve 100 percent on the the sjr being um uh, completed, but we did achieve the quality priority that we'd set of, of stroke of getting a, an A rating. Uh, and we did achieve the establishment that we've already spoken about, about the medical examiner uh, being appointed. With regards to learning from areas and reducing avoidable harm and in-hospital infection, the measures again that we'd set within that, we did achieve reducing medication harm, the target that we set with that uh, with regards to errors. The surgical site infection, a reduction of five percent we didn't meet but we've talked about uh, obviously the increased surveillance around that um has been a, a good thing although it's shown an increase um and then all patients with sepsis will be identified and treated with antibiotics one hour um um was was not met either now with regards to patient experience um again the measures around this uh it was about a learning basically in essence it's about a learning culture um, being present in order to reduce harm and improve the patient experience. So the measures we had was to achieve MDT hours spent on quality improvement related learning events to increase by 10% across trust. We did, we did achieve that. Trust strategy, um, 
achievement will be measured with the core patient experience KPIs. That's how I was treated with compassion. Uh, I was treated safely. I was involved in my plan of care. They, they're the KPIs that was achieved. We've rolled that out now in our, our um, we did that with our trials of our patient platform, uh, patient feedback platforms that we had. So that's good. And obviously that's been taken forward now. Uh, and the other measure we had where we will work with patients and families with co-design care improvements. Um, and we did that around um, our complaints management. That was a key focus with that co-design work um, with, with patients uh, last year. So that's around against uh, how we performed against the quality priorities and then looking at performance against the NHS improvement indicators, as mentioned in the report, we did achieve 92% on RT RTT. We did struggle, unfortunately, with achieving the four hour uh, target. We did meet the 60, we didn't meet, sorry, the 62 day measure for waiting time to start initial cancer treatment. But this was due to the increased demand that we'd seen in the previous year of 9.2%. And then the initial diagnostic test or procedure um, should be completed within six weeks. We, we missed that target, mainly due again to an increase in the two week um, rural referral um, on the cancer pathway, um, which had a significant impact on endoscopy uh, services. And then um, just to talk a little bit about our internal audit, normally this gets a scrutiny from an internal audit perspective, but due to again the pandemic, our external audit um, opinion on the data quality has not been required for this reporting period. And that was set um, from NHS uh, IE. Um, uh, so that just to make that point, that's not happened. And also just to emphasise that our quality and um, priorities that we've set, we've continued with some slight tweaks, but continued for our the, this year that we're in now for 2020, 2021, because we absolutely recognise that we're on a complete journey with these quality priorities. And really it's all lining in with our trust strategy. And so we are two years into that st trust strategy and the quality aspect to that about that is becoming a learning organisation. So to really embed that, this isn't going to, you know, we won't achieve any single measures really, or any particular measures within a year. It is a journey that we're on to get full for compliance with that. So just to articulate, it's a journey for us, but um, but there has been some improvements, which is good to see. So that's it really for the annual report. I have to take any any uh, questions or points on that. Uh, Neil? Yes, look, Andrea and, and colleagues on the Quality Committee, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood something properly. So I was looking at the page in the report where it said National Clinical Audits Reviewed. Um, mm. Am I right in understanding the committee has reviewed 45 reports and then concluded which of them have implications for our hospital? And then the table below table three is just an illustration of some of the findings and work we're working on. Or is that table the most important findings that we've chosen to to highlight? Improvement yeah. actions from national clinical orders. I want to make sure I understood why we'd chosen to highlight some and not others. That's all. Which which page is that on? Sorry, uh, Neil. Um, it's page twenty three in the report, headed National Clinical Audits Reviewed. I'm not sure, David. Do you need? Are you able to comment on that? David, you're on mute. Just trying to find the page. Yeah, it's 24. Is it 24 as? Uh... The report says National Clinical Audits Reviewed. The reports of 45 national audits were reviewed by ASPH in the 12 months to March 2020. And then the trust is intending to take the following action. So I, I was just going to ask after clarifications. You've looked at 45 reports and concluded that some or all of them have implications for us. I'm not quite sure. And then you've chosen to highlight some actions that we've chosen to take. And is that because they are the most important or are they a selection of what's important? I, I think this. they're the ones yeah. we're taking forward after we review Yeah. Them. We'll be compliant with quite a lot of these things, but clearly there are gaps when they come out that we then need to make sure we're compliant with. So that's what I presume. But I will check on that, Neil, I think. Yeah, and that and that's my understanding actually, Neil, as well. But we will we will check with the with the the other yeah, team. OK, thank you. We should clarify, though, that those reports have not come to the Quality of Care Committee. Yeah. Yeah. 
can I just say a lot of these, Neil, are national audits. So they're they're audits that obviously we quite often mandated to to take part in. Um, and so they are we we put data into them and then the key findings are then sent back out, which is obviously what you can see. And then we need to make a judgment about the actions we need to take internally. Um, and, and actually, because of COVID, there's been a, a stop on many of the national audits. Um, so uh, I, I think we do need to pick up that point that you've said about because we, we haven't. You're right, Marcy, and we haven't seen that um, at the Quality Committee. OK, thank you. Any others? Just uh, normally this goes with the um, uh, accounts. So where does this go to, Andrea? It's as in well, where, would, because the, the accounts get set before Parliament, don't they? But does this quality account go to the same place or where, where, where does it end up? I mean, we approve it today. Where does it go? So it goes into it gets fed up into NHSI is my understanding. You're right. It all goes as a previously, I think, as a one. But the, because of the quality account piece, unless um, that's that's my understanding. We are required to publish it. Mm. which is one of the kind of the key reasons that uh, some of the comments I made that auditors would have picked up as making sure it's clear to the public on what yes. some of the indicators mean and some of the language. But um, it is a published doc document on our website. Yeah. OK, OK. And does it go to CQC as well? Yeah, okay. CQC will get cited. Yes, I absolutely. OK, uh, Chris. Um, question for Andrea, really. Uh, Andrea, I wasn't too clear. You know, in the quality committee, we talked about the CQC ratings mm. and how they were presented to make sure the narrative linked to the stats, um, you know, in terms of where we require improvement versus where we are outstanding, for example, because mm. you've got that, you know, in critical care, we're outstanding, but in urgent uh, extent, we're not. So um, have we got the, have we, have you changed that narrative at all? I couldn't, couldn't see to make sure that the story is clear. Because obviously, if this goes to the public domain, we want to make sure that, you know, we've acknowledged the CQC uh, ratings, but also to make sure that they understand the mitigating actions we're taking uh, in a broad sense to to put, put the trust back into a good position. So we did, we did take on board what was said at the committee and, yeah, the changes were made. I mean, I don't know if if if, if that well, what's presented it's, now is to make sure that if everyone looks reads that, that yeah. we're happy in terms of how we're presented uh, in terms of our CQC rating and the narrative that, that, that is accompanying it. Because it wasn't too clear to us at the quality committee, and I just want to make sure that I hadn't compared like for like. If you like, I just had time to do that. Yeah. So I think it has been. It has been, but we'll just double sanity check right. before right. we. Um, yeah. Uh, before we send it on. Thank you. Neil, your hands up. Sorry, schoolboy error. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So, um, with a couple of things to check, then, are we mm -hmm. happy to approve the quality account? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, we now come to that very, very important time, especially as it approaches lunchtime, which says break. Um, and just to just so people know, uh, the members of the public who are here, um, latest health and safety executive guidelines are that we, you know, we don't spend all day staring at screens without breaks. So we've, uh, Sal and I have worked uh, the various uh, meetings today to put in uh, decent breaks for people to uh, stretch their legs and so on. So uh, we will meet again, please, uh, so that we can start sharp at 12.20. Thank you. Am I right in thinking there's a separate uh, meeting invitation for the second half? Uh, yes, yes, there is, Keith, yes. So I think just to remind colleagues that you actually have to join yet another uh, team's oh. uh, invitation. So we hang up. Yes. Right. Oh, well, I hadn't realised that. <laughs> Thank you for spotting that, Keith. I hadn't realised that. Well, I you know how you know my struggles with teams. <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have been busy chairing a committee of one, which would have got a lot done. But <laughs> of course, you can solve, Keith. Thanks. Yeah. Half of my preparation for meetings is uh, getting all the invitations lined up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. So <laughs> Thanks for that. We'll meet you on the new link. Thank you.